At this business talk with Khalid and Marit, the first all English business podcast in Ethiopia, we'll be talking to policymakers, investors, business leaders, and entrepreneurs to bring you the latest development taking place in the Ethiopian economic and business climate, and more importantly, what it all means to you. At this business talk. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. This is At this business talk with Khalid and Marit, the first all English podcast business show in Ethiopia. My name is Marit Bishrat, along with my co-host, Khalid Mawi. Thank you for joining us. The show is brought to you by Pragma Investment Advisory, an investment management and advisory firm based in Addis Ababa, along with our partners, The Five One Communications, a very prominent PR and marketing firm also based in Addis Ababa. Last week, Friday, on November 27th, Ethiopia has taken a significant milestone in its liberalization process of the telecom sector by announcing the much-anticipated request for proposal RFP for the interested telecom operators to acquire the license to join the telecom sector. Since the Ethiopian government announced to liberalize the telecom sector back in 2018, the government through the Ministry of Finance and ECA, the newly established Ethiopian Communication Authority, has been working relentlessly to bid the, the required legal and regulatory frameworks to open the telecom sector for the private players. On today's session, to talk about the announced request for proposal, RFP, and the next steps, we have invited Dr. Brooke Taye, the Senior Advisor at the Ministry of Finance. Dr. Brooke Taye, a very warm well welcome to our this business talk, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Murad. Uh, thank you, Khalid. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you, sir. Uh, so, as an icebreaker question, as we do usually on this show, uh, uh, to, before we start our conversation, Tell us about your background and upbringing. I know that uh, you studied abroad and prior to joining the Ministry of, Foreign, uh, Ministry of Finance, you used to work as a lawyer and investment manager. Uh, tell us uh, those, uh, ca- your career experience and how did you join the Ministry of Finance? So thank you, uh, Marit. Uh, well, in terms of background, uh, you know, I was born and raised uh, in Ethiopia and I this um, and uh, went to uh, primary school and secondary school uh, here. And I also did uh, my college years, um, studied marketing here. Um, and then uh, I went to England to uh, do uh, my A-levels and I read law in England um, at the School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, and after that, I've, uh, I've done um, my master's in uh, law and economics and uh, European program where I studied um, in three different universities uh, in you know, behavioral law and economics, uh, law and institution, and, and some other interesting topics as well. Um, in terms of work, I've been involved in uh, finance and, and law uh, for several years uh, you know, before I, I started uh, uh, writing my PhD. I was uh, supporting a company uh, that was focused in West Africa in terms of investment um, and, and also uh, some other companies uh, who were based out of the Middle East uh, and were interested to work in Africa. Um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, fate would have it. I ended up having an opportunity to uh, join a law firm uh, in New York, and that's a banking law firm called Windows Smarks um, as a regulatory analyst and economist, and been working there for over six years. Um, it's been an exciting, uh, exciting. Uh, of experience and while working there uh, I got another offer to move out you know move to Miami and uh, run an investment fund um, and you know uh, been doing that I was doing that uh, until uh, November 2018 uh, where I got a call from uh, um, His Excellency the Minister of Finance uh, uh, with an offer to uh, join um, his team at the Ministry of Finance and uh, to really uh, work on some of the most exciting reform aspects of uh, uh, this administration uh, in the past two years. Um, excellent, Brooke. Uh, I think it's, it's great to, to have you be part of the, of the Ethiopian brain gain. Um, and uh, thank you for, for outlining some of the background there that you have. Um, moving to the main topic of, of conversation, um, now, on November 27th, as, as Marit mentioned in his intro, uh, the Ethiopian Communications Authority released the much-awaited RFP to issue full telecom licenses to two operators. Um, if you can give us an overview of the bidding proceedings, um, mainly around the anatomy of the RFP, RFP itself, the eligibility criteria for, for bid participation, 
any important deadlines that we need to consider and, and also whether mobile operators who have not partaken in the uh, expression of interest that was um, issued back in May uh, can still participate or not. Thank you, Khalid. I think uh, it would be only fair uh, to give a little bit of a background before I jump straight into the RFP for your listeners to appreciate um, the kind of uh, several amount of work that had to go through before we published the RFP Absolutely. Uh, on November 27th. So, as you know, uh, the government uh, identified the ICT sector, the telecom sector, the communication sector as one of the anchors of um, Ethiopia's economic growth drivers going forward. And this is memorialized by the, the introduction or the addition of the ICT sector in its uh, homegrown economic reform as one of the, the, the pillars of uh, growth drivers. Um, and as a result of that, uh, the government introduced um, a new proclamation uh, uh, by uh, you know, the communication services proclamation back in uh, August 2019. Uh, specifically to liberalize the telecom sector that was dominated by only one operator uh, for over 100 years. Um, I know previously there were some activities to an extent that uh, government was willing to uh, entertain partnership uh, in the telecom sector, but this is the first time in Ethiopian history where the government actively pursued private participation in the delivery of communication services uh, to citizens. Once that law has uh, successfully passed by uh, the House of People's Representative, the next task of, uh, of the team was setting up the Ethiopian Communications Authority. I know you guys had a chat with uh, Engineer Balcha on the background, so I, I won't uh, you know, kind of dwell on it, but just wanted to, um, just wanted to kind of uh, you know, say that um, the Ethiopian Communications Authority um, was established uh, as a result of the introduction of the, the new uh, law and um, the ECA, for short, the Ethiopian Communications Authority, uh, started working on identifying the necessary secondary uh, legal instruments that would allow um, the liberalization, the opening up of the sector. Um, you know, that took its own, uh, its own uh, time and in terms of Ministry of Finance, where much more focused in terms of hiring the, uh, the expertise that we needed um, by way of a transaction advisor. Um, once we um, you know, fulfilled that requirement, uh, we got it ourselves uh, into a, a more focused approach um, to identify the valuation of the, the spectrum that will be auctioned and um, the different uh, licensing requirements that needs to be part of the RFP. You know, we've done a lot of uh, um, stakeholder consultation. I think uh, this is the most transparent uh, kind of open engagement uh, that uh, the government uh, aimed to attract as many feedback as possible from all, all stakeholders. Um, in the last uh, um, you know, virtual uh, uh, webinar that we had, uh, over 120 stakeholders were present commenting on the 17 directives that were issued by um, ECA. Once we've uh, concluded that, uh, we've uh, issued an expression of interest and uh, 12 companies responded, 11 um, telecom operators. Um, as you know, it kind of the juggernauts of the telecom world, you know, the Vodafone's of this world, MTN, Orange, um, ET Salat, Saudi Telecom, and the list goes on. Yeah. All of them showed uh, um, express their interest to take part in this process. And uh, we've communicated that to the public and, and the stakeholders as well. And um, last week, as, as you mentioned, Marit, uh, we've announced the request for proposal, uh, which will be open to everyone who will be interested. This is not limited only to uh, the companies that showed their interest um, two months ago, uh, I believe when we issued the expression of interest. This is uh, open for everyone. So in terms of, uh, in terms of process or content, uh, obviously uh, this is uh, a tender document and there are uh, you know, requirements for us to make sure that um, we keep uh, some of the contents as, as, uh, as robust as possible. 
by having a technical and financial um, aspect of it to make sure that we attract or the final, I mean, I think we've attracted already um, strong bidders, but at the end of the day, we want the strongest to be the one uh, that will, uh, that who will end up uh, winning this uh, license, uh, the two licenses. And, you know, the game, uh, the, the aim of the, the government is to make sure, uh, to, is to ensure that uh, the two companies that will take part in the, uh, in this process and end up winning um, the two licenses would deliver on, um, on the commitment uh, that the government has made to, uh, to the people, allowing, making sure that the digital economy um, will uh, be the, drivers, the driver of economic growth in Ethiopia. And this is not, not a lip service. I mean, we know that uh, our competitive advantage in Ethiopia is our young population. And one thing that I can guarantee you is we can't make everyone a factory worker. We can't create, you know, industrial park related jobs for everyone. But if you allow a 19, 20 year old, you know, provide them uh, the best internet, internet connection in the world and with some sort of a smart device you know, by way of um, or a laptop, they're connected to the world. They're connected to the global economy. Mm -hmm. So they, now they're not competing or they're not looking for a job only in the contours of the sovereign land of Ethiopia. They're, they're competing against kids in Pakistan or kids in, in Spain. You know, so that's the commitment. So uh, this RFP aims to whittle down you know, the most competitive and, 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 uh, and technically capable uh, company who would value this opportunity to the highest uh, by way of their financial commitment uh, to be part of, uh, uh, to win uh, this process. So the RFE aims to do that. Um, and in terms of, you know, quick uh, uh, content wise, uh, we'll have, uh, as I've said, the, the a quantitative and qualitative element to it. And um, by way, you know, when we say the qualitative element, you know, this comp the companies that would, um, would qualify uh, on the technical aspect of it would be required to fulfill, uh, you know, the coverage uh, expectation, uh, sub service quality, um, you know, past experience in terms of deploying uh, 3G and 4G, uh, past experience in terms of uh, uh, introducing various type of new services, uh, their uh, current date position because we don't want the company to come in and go bust in about a year and then um, fail to deliver on its commitment. So those are the contents of uh, the RFP. Um, so, uh, you know, the kind of the process, as I've said, this is open for everyone who would be interested to participate in this process and everyone um, and who would meet the initial requirements. So, so what we would do is, uh, you know, we already published uh, on the Financial Times and various media outlets, uh, the advertisement a call for, um, you know, the RFP and individuals who are probably listening to your, uh, your, your podcast and uh, this program who wanted to participate, um, they can uh, check out the, um, the contents of uh, the steps one needs to take in order to participate in this process from the ECA website. Um, and, um, but just to you know, quickly go through what the process the process is. Mm -hmm. um, you need to uh, sign a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, mm -hmm. That's one of the requirement uh, because this RFP document uh, is only accessible uh, after uh, bidders pay um, uh, the fifteen thousand uh, dollar that that is currently uh, that is the cost of uh, the RFP. Um, and we obviously would uh, communicate, you know, send this RFP once the NDA is signed. And the fifty thousand is paid. Uh, thank you, Brooke, for that elaborative response. Uh, uh, of course, as you mentioned, it's uh, that uh, uh, Ministry of Finance, also the Ethiopian Communication Authority, has uh, you guys have done a lot of work into this uh, to reach at this point. It's uh, and we we we'll hope hopefully it's going to be done very soon. Uh, so moving forward, uh, last week's announcement addresses only the liberalization of the telecom sector regarding the, the issuance of the TUM licenses. Uh, however, there is also the privatization aspect 
of course, uh, the Ethiopian Telecom will be privatized as announced. It. Uh, has the ministry come up with a time frame or a procedure how to partially privatize uh, the incumbent Ethiopian Telecom? Would there be any announcement anytime soon like this, like uh, last week, and uh, regarding the process? What's the government's plans on, uh, plan on this? So thank, thank you, Marid. Uh, I really appreciate the question. Uh, I mean, just obviously, uh, in terms of the partial privatization of the telecom, um, one thing that needs to be clear is that uh, the government will make um, the necessary announcement, not only for um, potential bidders, but also for uh, all the stakeholders, the public, uh, the timeline, the process, and the various activities that will be, it will be engaged in. But by way of background, uh, where we are currently, uh, is that uh, we've hired uh, Deloitte uh, to be the transaction advisor. Um, that required several months uh, for various reasons. We wanted to make sure that we bring on board qualified experts um, as part of a team of the transaction advisors to support the government and to support the public enterprise holding an administration agency, um, PIHA for short, uh, to um, who lead the transaction advisory part of it. So there will be announcement uh, by PIHA, by Ministry of Finance, uh, whichever one uh, would have been appropriate in terms of the, the announcement and which agency uh, would need to do that. But there will be announcement based on the process. Uh, we anticipate that once we conclude the, uh, the liberalization aspect of it by issuing the two, two new licenses, um, I think um, in a few months after that, uh, we expect or we anticipate that the partial privatization work mm -hmm. will be also uh, concluded. So I don't want to put a time frame on it right now. As you know, transactions are um, okay. a, a kind of uh, an activity where you need to do several things uh, in advance, but at the same time, be dynamic enough to adjust. Uh, so, uh, but one thing that I can assure you is in very... Uh, short amount of time after the conclusion of the issuance of the two new, li the two new licenses, we'll be able to uh, conclude the partial privatization process. Excellent, thank you for that, Burke. Um, now, moving to the elephant in the room, uh, with the ongoing political turned military conflict in the Tigray region since the 4th of November between uh, um, you know, Tigray Regional Special Forces and the Ethiopian National Defense Forces, there seems to be uh, growing concerns from international business communities regarding the stability of the country and possible disruptions around the ongoing economic reforms that the government is conducting, um, notably in telecom, but of course other uh, sectors as well. My question is, how does uh, the government address these concerns to ensure the prevalence of order and stability in Ethiopia so that uh, perhaps investors and the business community as a whole can, can remain confident? Thanks, Marud. Uh, thanks, Khalid. Um, so, um, look, I think uh, we need to call a spade a spade. Uh, this is not uh, a process, this is not an activity that would uh, be dragging uh, for a long time. The law enforcement activity of the government uh, has um, been concluded or to the final stages by uh, successfully our national defense force successfully um, capturing uh, Mekale, as you all know. Um, so for us, this is uh, something that I will conclude very soon. And, you know, people who are responsible to this heinous act will be brought to justice. Um, so that's a legal process that needs to go through. Um, but one thing that I want to be very, very clear and, you know, for the investors as well, the government does not work to stabilize the country to benefit investors coming into Ethiopia. The government, it's an existential uh, uh, requirement for the government to make sure that peace and stability uh, is, is ascertained in Ethiopia to make sure its constituencies and people who would hold it accountable uh, are safe and secure. So um, of course there would be a concern uh, from various investors uh, about um, this law enforcement operation. But I think, you know, the, the main target of the government will look at um, this operation, not from a point of view of making sure Ethiopia is uh, a conducive investment destination, 
it's from a point of view of making sure that Ethiopia is safe and secure for Ethiopians and that all of us can live in a, in a, in a peaceful um, and, uh, and, you know, kind of a, a lawful country. So, you know, with that being said, uh, so far, I mean, we've, uh, we've discussed with the companies who, uh, issue, who were participated in the expression of interest. None of them had raised any concern about this uh, um, law enforcement operation. For me, uh, it tells me two things. One, they really have done their due diligence and they have a much better understanding about Ethiopia than the so-called experts who would uh, go on, on telly and, and, and talk about our situation. Uh, so I think they have an understanding that this is a necessary uh, law enforcement operation that the government has conducted. Um, so, and they know that the time frame as to uh, its, uh, its success and the time frame that it will conclude. And, but the second and most important thing is, uh, you know, they have an experience uh, in many different African countries with much less, uh, uh, you know, peace and, and uh, stability uh, in the country. They, they're active. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't want to say uh, this country or that country, but I leave it to your listeners and I leave it to you guys to, to have that, you know, to, to, to imagine which countries that we're talking about. They're active mm -hmm. in this country. Yep. So our country is much more stable and secure and um, then it's not even comparable to some of the countries that these operators are currently active. So I think they know betting in Ethiopia is, is a sure bet. And they know that not only they will uh, benefit in terms of a financial gain, but also uh, for them, this is the last frontier of telecom uh, liberalization. This is the a deal of a century when it comes to telecom liberalization. There is no other country left in this world with a closed market uh, environment that would liberalize uh, um, in the next year or two or even 10 years. Everywhere except Ethiopia, with the same magnitude in terms of the volume of clients that you'd expect and the volume of transaction that you'd expect, that's left uh, unopened. And I don't think any serious operator would uh, want to miss this opportunity um, you know, consider just by uh, looking at uh, what the government is lawfully doing uh, in the northern part. At this business talk. Absolutely, it is the deal of the century, and uh, thank you, Brooke, for addressing this. Uh, it is a, it is a very important point uh, that need to be addressed, especially the, in this kind of transactions. Uh, uh, so uh, I th I'm sure you have heard it in different medias. There are uh, different reports by some telecom operators sometimes assessing the estimated bid price for these two new licenses. And recently, uh, some, te some telecom operators uh, claimed that the bid price for the two new licenses uh, would be reduced significantly because the European government hasn't allowed mobile money for foreign telecom operators. What is your response to this? Do you think the bid price would be reduced for not allowing the mobile money for the two new operators? Do you think this kind of assertion, assertions or claims would affect would affect the entire process of the liberalization? No, I don't think so. I, I think there is a, a little bit of a confusion that we need to clarify. The government of Ethiopia is giving uh, or issuing uh, telecom licenses, not banking license. So mm. the, uh, assuming that there will be some sort of uh, an implicit banking license that will be issued with the telecom license is wrong. Um, so if somebody started their exercise or thinking, um, started assuming that that would be the case, of course, they need to discount it from their assumption. But we've never started from a point of view saying that we will be giving uh, or the government will be issuing two new telecom licenses and a, a banking license. That was never said and that was never part of uh, this discussion. So. Um, you can only do something adverse to what you said to limit your opportunity to, uh, you know, in terms of the value of what you're offering. 
but since we've never uttered the word saying that we'll be issuing a banking license as part of the telecom license, yeah. I don't think, um, you know, as far as we're concerned from the point we're in, uh, the, the valuation of uh, these licenses um, would be affected at all. That's one. And second, uh, on a broader discussion in terms of the value of uh, the two licenses, I think, uh, you know, some of the bidders um, or some of the operators um, are, are used to um, kind of influencing uh, government decision in some mm -hmm. other jurisdictions. But obviously in Ethiopia, you know how, mm -hmm. how, uh, how we work and you know how uh, you know, the government wants to run a very transparent process. Yes. So the, the little attempt of trying to send a signal is not mm -hmm. gonna cut it actually. It, would, it could create, um, could be considered as collusion. It could be considered as antitrust, part of the antitrust uh, uh, legal framework. And then you know, it could end up uh, forcing some bidders to be, uh, uh, you know, end up receiving uh, some sort of a measure from the appropriate appropriate authority. So in order to address that, uh, and obviously, but the other the other side of the coin is everybody's entitled uh, to make a comment about this process. You know, uh, they have a freedom of speech, uh, and they can make a learned judgment about the value. They can make judgment about um, the process as long as that does not cause uh, the red line whereby you really start signaling um, how much you are willing to pay for this uh, spectrum uh, to the other operators. So in order to avoid that going forward, because now we're at the stage where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, uh, we've included it on the tender regulation, a very stringent requirement that this type of uh, sending signal um, via, um, you know, third parties, you know, uh, mediums is, is could lead to uh, uh, or lead to some sort of uh, uh, sanction. So um, I, I'm sure the bidders who would be participating um, in this um, yeah. they will recognize the seriousness of this type of activity and they will refrain from it. But from our end, uh, we can approach it strategically. We know how a deal works. So we make sure that this type of, you know, uh, unnecessary um, discussion doesn't, uh, you know, stop happening. But at the same time, we can approach it from a legal point of view. But, you know, you need, you need uh, we have a very uh, strong bunch of uh, uh, operators who are interested in this process. So um, I don't think uh, the, the they would take a risk of listening to, uh, um, you know, uninvited comment from uh, some some other operator uh, who just uh, uttering words about the valuation of uh, Spectrum in their point of view, um, because they, that could lead to a significant consequence uh, as part of the tender regulation requirements. Yeah, much needed clarifications there. Uh, thank you, uh, Brooke. Now, with respect to telecom infrastructure licensing, uh, you, you may very well know that there has been uh, some, I would say, contradictory viewpoints, uh, and some would argue lack of clarity around the issue of independent tower and power companies to uh, possibly operate or not in Ethiopia as, as part of the liberalization process. Um, now, Ethio Telecom had um, you know, expressly disagreed with the involvement of independent infrastructure companies, claiming that it has already developed the necessary infrastructure and groundwork. Uh, whereas the ECA, as you mentioned earlier, we also had Atobalja on the show, um, deliberated on studying Ethio Telecom's uh, capabilities to accommodate um, the infrastructure needs of two more operators before uh, jumping to any conclusion. Um, are you able to, to shed some light on, on this matter? Has there been any conclusive decision made uh, by the government so far? Thank you, uh, Khalid. I think there is a very clear and conclusive decision that was made by, made by the Ethiopian Communications Authority and the government by extension. Um, the clear indication is telecom tower companies who are interested to participate as third party and who are not associated um, uh, or were not part of the operators would be um, winning these two licenses, would not be issued a license at this stage. We've been clear 
uh, our reasoning uh, and we've been clear um, in terms of uh, why uh, the, you know this decision has to be made just to touch upon it you know Tio telecom invested significant amount of money uh, deploying um, its towers throughout ethiopia this is a national a national resource we need to utilize it to the maximum optimally and when you have 7,500 or so towers covering um, 80 or 90% of the country, uh, not kind of encouraging the full utilization of those towers is not acceptable because you have to work uh, towards your national interest first. Uh, you know, so um, it's to our national interest to make sure that these towers uh, the fiber optics and everything that the government spent so much money, uh, borrowed money, in fact, uh, to make sure that they're utilized yeah. 100%. But at the same time, the two operators are fully entitled to deploy their own towers anywhere else in Ethiopia. Uh, they can build it themselves. They can, the two can partner and then build uh, as one company it, this is their corporate structure, and it's, it's, it has um, it will not be something that the government will direct them on how to uh, organize themselves. What we're saying is, and what ECA is saying is, that third-party tower companies will not be licensed at this stage. In terms of, is this is this something that's going to be forever? Is this is this something that uh, uh, will not be reviewed again? No, I mean, at the end of the day, infrastructure deployment um, would be something that will be revised based on uh, on a needed basis. On need, when you need further um, policy uh, adjustment, you do the same thing, uh, you know. So, I think ECA it will study uh, the market capacity and then will continue the same thing. I, I really wanted to associate this with. Uh, uh, with the question, I, I don't hear a lot of people asking why only two new licenses, why not five, mm. why not 10? Uh, even the fact that the government decision not to allow a Ford operator for the next 10 years, it goes back to the same thing. You study the market dynamics, you review how much would this market could absorb in terms of new operators, and then you make a determination because at the end of the day, the private sector needs to make a reasonable return. But at the same time, there are already investments that the government has made in the sector that you would want to have uh, uh, some sort of a return because you don't want them to be um, just wasted. So, uh, you know, from the policy point of view, you need to juggle multiple goals so that you have you get into the, a decision uh, that may not satisfy uh, some people. But I think in terms of national interest, that's our gui guiding principle. That's our northern star. If it's it's a force, and you know it's good for the national interest, then it would be a policy that would be adopted. So, but in short, there's a very clear decision. The two new uh, uh, operators that will end up uh, uh, winning this uh, this uh, bid will be allowed to deploy their own infra their own infrastructure, international gateway, uh, anything that they would they would need. This is a full. Um, telecom uh, license uh, that a uh, full service telecom license that they will be awarded. But the, the other services, the individual and class licenses, they will be determined um, uh, by EC um, and the policy will be de decided, uh, will be revised on, on uh, you know, going forward and seeing how the market will adopt. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for addressing that, book. Uh, uh, so this is going to be our last question. Uh, so far, we've been discussing the technical aspect of uh, all this, uh, the whole process of, uh, of the liberalization process of the telecom sector. Uh, when we bring the conversation to the normal people, people like startup communities, the farmers, at the end of the day, what they see the value of all this process is the benefit is going to bring them, right? Uh, that's, the, that's the end goal. From your perspective, uh, what do you think it means for the larger society, for, for the larger community, uh, for people like farmers who uh, farmers living in the countryside, uh, people who have aspiration in the startup ecosystem, the youngsters who are seeking jobs, uh, and uh, and the conversation. There is a strong conversation in terms of digitalizing the whole Ethiopian economy. What do you think 
this means and what kind of benefit is going to bring down the line? I mean, Marid, I think uh, that that is the uh, essence of this reform. That is yeah. pretty much why uh, we work uh, as hard as possible to make sure that we have a competitive, um, efficient uh, telecom service in Ethiopia. We're the last one in, in, in mm. Africa, uh, except from a few uh, countries where, uh, you know, connecting to uh, the World Wide Web would require, you, would require you to go through several hoops, you know. Um, if you're a business, you're trying to transfer data from one office to the other. If you're a, an entrepreneur who wanted to create uh, some sort of an app and, uh, you know, provide a more efficient way of uh, uh, your, your services. Yeah. That's all stifled. I mean, th this is without even going to the rural areas. What yes. could happen? I'll give you an example. There's been a, a report that I've been, I've, I've been uh, reading uh, on the healthcare uh, related aspect of uh, digitization. When you have such a, a kind of dispersed uh, society like Ethiopia, where uh, our biggest city, uh, Addis, and the next biggest city is not even one third of its population, uh, that tells you that we have so many people who live in a very, uh, you know, kind of dispersed type of settlement, right? So yeah. you can't have um, a bus or a black line type of hospital in every Wereda or every zone. Mm -hmm. So what do you need to do? You, need, you can have the doctor, you can have the specialist sitting in the Kurambasa hospital and could diagnose, review an X-ray, uh, uh, prescribe medication, um, kind of look after patients who are, you know, 1,000 miles away from, uh, from where they're sitting if you have a very good internet connection. And this happens and this is how it works in the rest of the world. Why not us? Look at how the exams are, you know, the, you know in terms of uh, um, 12th grade, 8th grade examinations. You have to print the, the exam, you have to transport it to a location, and you have to secure those um, exam papers. And if there's any issue with, with kind of the road, then the students' exam uh, will be disrupted after working so much to, to, sit, that for, to sit for that exam. If you have a, a digitized, you know, the structure is there, the infrastructure is there, and the schools and, and Kavales and Woredas are connected, and somebody sitting in Arat Kilo from Ministry of uh, uh, Education could release the exam, it could be disseminated on every school, in the entire a nation and exams could be taken in a more secure way. I mean, there are many benefits. I mean, I, we can go through them. It's like trying to convince the the the, the benefit of a, a car. Uh, you yeah. know, it's just like arguing that the world needs a car or the world doesn't need a car. I mean, mm -hmm. it's 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 not um, it's not a rocket science. I mean, it's just very simple. So, but the the, the other essential element of it is the just because we need that type of services yeah, uh, to the agri-sector, to education, to health uh, and, and businesses. The way you would approach that reform, you need to be very cautious and careful because if you, uh, you know, just look, you know, if you're looking at all those benefits and then you run towards them without really uh, designing a robust legal structure, establishing um, a competent regulatory authority, supporting uh, the regulatory, uh, the regulatory authority with yeah. all the, uh, the needs it, it has, then uh, you won't be able to achieve all of mm -hmm. those uh, goals. So I think, uh, you know, in about a year or two, uh, when we look back and, and start seeing uh, the new businesses that will proliferate throughout Ethiopia as a direct result of the digital economy, um, will be amazed. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> you guys know Khalid and Merit, um, yeah. how many Ethiopians live in Nairobi, yeah. <laughs> yes. including my own family members, <laughs> just because the, their work required them, yep. <laughs> required them to have a stable internet connection, you know. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Are, uh, working in one of those giants, um, you know, telecom companies, communication companies, and internet companies who can be in Ethiopia and delivering the services. 
and then look at what we can do by just looking at deliver at these first yes. right with just a minuscule quality of uh, an internet connection we can create so much so many jobs and new services so i think uh, let's just wait a couple of years i don't think we need to wait a couple of years we just need to see the reform succeed and in about a year or two uh, you will see the phenomenon uh, of this this country and, and and the young population in terms of creating new jobs Absolutely, uh, Brooke. On that very, very promising and, and optimistic note, uh, Dr. Brooke Taye, Senior Advisor at the Ministry of Finance, we have actually long awaited your appearance on the show, and it finally happened. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation <laughs> to join us on At This Business Talk. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marir. Thank you, Khalid. I really appreciate uh, um, your show. Um, it's always a pleasure to uh, listening to it. And it's actually uh, something that's really needed in the the media sphere uh, talking about business and from a different point of view as well. So thank you guys for having me. Thank you. At this business talk. To our esteemed audience and listeners, at this business talk has now officially gone fully digital, meaning we're off the radio waves and revamping our online presence. We're already available, of course, on YouTube, Audio Mac, and Castbox, and soon enough, we shall announce more popular podcast platforms that at this business talk will begin to stream on. So stay tuned as we publish our episodes every other Thursday, and thank you for being part of the ABT family. Business Talk.